Son of Pothos. After the fatal duel with Monsieur de Bregui and the warning by his second, Joel is journeying back to Paris. His mind rejects any idea of danger and is filled instead with thoughts of Mademoiselle de Tremblay, whom he hopes to meet that evening at Vespers at the Church of St. Paul. But while he travels, his thoughts so happily occupied, plans of quite another nature are being made for Mademoiselle de Tremblay. Aramis, the Duke of Almada, sits before the huge carved marble of his fireplace, an old and elegant figure in his great armchair, staring thoughtfully as if he could not quite understand the import of the words he has just heard. You are certain of these things, Valerie? Quite certain, my lord. Marchioness makes no secrets of her feelings. And you say that she seems more than ever assured of the power of her charms and the success of her ambition. She is most confident, my lord. And boasts openly that she's been told by a fortune teller that Louis will soon be free to marry her. And by so doing, will raise her to supreme rank in the realm. By so doing, he will ruin all our hopes and projects completely. When is his majesty expected back? According to my information, he's expected to return from Lille de Saint-Germain almost immediately. Then we must make haste. The circumstances force our hands. We must produce a court immediately the antidote to this noxious influence. The one who will eclipse in youth and beauty the Marchioness de Montespan. Mademoiselle de Tremblay. Exactly. Then you carried out my instruction? To the letter, my lord. I had her followed when she left the Nantes. She is staying with an ancient relative whose infirmities keep her indoors in the Rue Tournette. Oh. She comes forth in the morning to call on various lawyers, prophets, and so on. And in the evening has announced her intention of attending vespers at the church of St. Paul. You have done well. Now, can you find me some bold fellow devoid of principle who will do any kind of work if he be well paid for it? I have the very fellow you want. Your Excellency will be well suited. He styles himself Captain Cordes, and has been recently up in the country. He needs work. You can have him at a reduced price. How well things fit in for me. And uh, how long may I depend on his services? As long as your purse holds out, my lord. Good, good. Then you'll arrange an hmm? I can do so immediately. The rogue is here and waiting. Here? Now? Oh, Pastor Darier, you are a mind reader and invaluable to me. Knowing the urgency of this matter, my lord, I took the liberty of bringing Captain Cordoff with me. I'll bring him in now, if you wish it. Will you see him immediately? Yes, yes Pastor Darier, yes, at once. Ah, Boisarie, my friend, how D'Artagnan, Athos, and Porthos would have looked with contempt upon the webs I am spinning now. My lord, we work towards the great goal. Oh, those valiant champions of the wronged and oppressed. <laughs> but times have changed. The great conspiracies have gone and given place to domestic intrigues. <laughs> the old man's privilege to think nostalgically of the past and its glories. Ah, oh, but uh, come, let us do the business in hand. Uh, bring me your rogue, uh, Cordoff, and let us prepare a reception at St. Paul's for the lovely Mademoiselle Laurent. The Church of St. Paul's in the gathering Paris twilight. Its spires reaching up to the darkening sky. Its steps worn saucer shaped by the feet of centuries. In its dim, candlelit pews, a few old women listen to evening prayers. And Mademoiselle Aurore de Tremblay kneels reverently in the chapel of the Virgin. Outside, where the shadows are closing into pools of darkness, two people are waiting for her. On the worn steps, the tall figure of Joël. And over the road, half hidden in a doorway, the redoubtable Captain Cordbouf with several of his followers. Should she not be out by now, comrades? We have not much experience with church going, Captain. Uh, I warrant you haven't. Only you recognize the man upon the steps there. 
is something most familiar in his time. And so they should be. But it is none other than the Breton peasant whom we met upon the summer road. And it seems we're waiting for the same young lady. And I'll be glad to meet the rogue again and to have the saucy damsel in my power, too. <laughs> Don't forget the pretty bird has beak and claws to defend herself, as well as the rustic. Have we not a gag to prevent her making too much noise? As for the crown, we've ten good blades to do for him. Did you see Big Purse? Yes. He's in the coach waiting. At the end of the little lane where they must walk. I gave him your instructions. The rest of the men? Bear with him. Quiet now. Here she comes. He joined the rustic on the steps. We'll follow quietly and at a safe distance until I give the signal. No nonsense, mind. It is the special order of the noble lord who employs us. Take your time and do the thing well. Come now. You, monsieur. Come, you may escort me. It is a dark lane beside the church where I must go. In truth, there are few about. And if I'm not mistaken, this sudden darkness means a storm. Tell me, have you commenced your inquiries? Do you still count upon the success of your mission? I have made some inquiries, but unfortunately to little purpose. But what of your steps? Do they bid fair? Alas, I am not one to make supplication, having a proud spirit. If it were my own money was at stake, and not that of these poor orphan children... You would give up the task, then? Most certainly. And leave town the next day. Leave town? What else would you expect? I am not a Parisian. I am frightened and alone in this great city. How much better to live in the country that I know. My country is your own, too. With the wild rose and the golden firs, the cliffs and the ocean. And you would be content to dwell there, alone. I should esteem myself happy above all women if I had beside me one whom my heart had chosen. You mean some grand nobleman? Oh, my poor Joel, no. I am poor, and I've confessed that I'm proud. And this very pride prevents me from accepting anything from the man who weds me, save the wedding ring. But as a daughter of a noble, I am bound not to marry beneath me. Oh, why do you sigh? I am patient, and we are young. Can you not wait in confidence until heaven shall have blessed our efforts? Or until either you find your sire's name, or make one for yourself? Merciful heaven! What are you saying? Simply let it. I believe you love me. Am I not right? Indeed, mademoiselle. Aurore, I do not know how you could have guessed. And yet, yes, I love you with all my heart. You are my life. And have been since the moment I set eyes upon you. And I love you. To learn which, I had no need to hear the tale from your lips. I had but to listen to the beating of my own heart. Aurore. I cannot believe that this is true, and yet, see, I hold you in my arms. So frail, so small you are. Yet strong in my love for you, Joanne. Oh, see, the very heavens are thundering out our love. Come, we must hurry or we shall get wet. One kiss before we go. <gasps> oh, behind you! Joanne, look behind you! Yeah. So much for your protector, my fine lady. Help! Help! Do it! Come down this way. We have a carriage waiting for you. Do it! Do it! Oh, 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 oh. I'm coming! Here, lockbreaker, hold her. I'll deal with this gentleman. Underhand her! Out of my way! Oh, no passage this way, my lord. You! The captain of the royal marauder! None other. And I'll mark you this time for good where my pistol ball left the tree. My sword will answer you, my gallows bird, though not the business, Erdogan. Oh. 
so much for you. And now for these fine birds. Who's next for my sword? Stand back, Aurora, while I deal with them. Come now, who's next? You, sir? Or you? Stand back, you villain. Stand and fight like men. Aurora, are you hurt? Have they harmed you? Truly, I'd have killed the three of them with my own bare hands had they harmed a hair of your head. Joel. Joel. I am not hurt. So afraid that I can scarcely stand. And so you saved me from these ropes. I split his head and knave and would have run the others through had they stayed. Yet heaven help us, Joel. For this time we're lost. It seems the whole army has sprung from cracks in the ground. <laughs> and even your sword cannot cope with all this lot. Sometimes it is wiser to retreat. And yet I, I swear I cannot run a step. Oh, save yourself, Joel. For I cannot walk, let alone run. Save myself and leave you here? Quickly, let me carry you. Oh, hurry, Joel, hurry and leave me. For I will impede your progress. And there is no time. No more than a feather. There you are. There he is. There. He has on his shoulders, running like a dog. Up to him. And well for you that I am on my own. For had I not this precious bird of my sword would have had a gala day among you. Oh, thank heaven we are safe. At least I think we are. I see no sign of any of the villains. The storm has fought upon our side. They'll never find us in this downpour. Hurrah! Mercy on us, is she dead? Hurrah! No, no, it is but a faint. As on the summer highway, and who can blame her? She's frightened half to death and now wet through. I must find some place for her, or she will die. And yet I know not where we are and cannot see. The rain is like a wall all around us. Yet wait! That lightning showed a door that seemed familiar. Can it... Am I? I am. The Lord be praised. I do believe we are safe. Uh, merciful heaven, what apparition uh, is this out of this? I, I do beseech you, go to your mistress. Tell her I need her help. Tell her Joel of Loch Maria has come to claim her promise. Take me quickly to Francoise Dominier. 